This is September 13, 1999. I'm Barbara Slavin at the Morris Institute Library in Natick, Mass. And I'm interviewing John Pima for our Veterans Oral History Project. Uh, Mr. Pima, for the record, what is your name? How do you spell it? Uh, John Pema. John Pema, thank you. And your address? Natick. Uh -huh. And your age? Uh, eight, 69. It's hard for me to get it out. <laughs> Your marital status? A divorce. Mm -hmm. Any children? Two daughters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And grandchildren? No, not yet. Mm -hmm. Where were you born? I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we, yeah. where were you raised? I, well, f actually the first six years of my life was in Lang City, New Jersey. My father had a restaurant there. Then we moved to uh, North Carolina, Greensboro. And then in 1944, we moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, actually Darby, Pennsylvania. My father was always in the restaurant business. So uh, Pennsylvania, till uh, that's the time I, uh, during that time, went in the Air Force. And then I moved up to New England in 1970 with my wife and my first daughter. Mm -hmm. Been here ever since. So how, how long have you been in Natick? Oh, Natick's uh, uh, going on my third year. And how did you happen to move here? <clears throat> well, I, uh, I had been working in Peabody. I was uh, working in, in as a process control engineer. Then I, I uh, retired for a while. Then I started working, I, doing consulting work. Mm -hmm. And then I completely retired, and I just moved to this area because it was a desirable area. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, reasonable housing available. And uh, so I... May I ask you, what, uh, what is your family background? Um, when you, uh, well, e ethnically... Uh, oh, both my parents. I came from Albania, yeah. and nobody heard of it until fairly recently. <laughs> and um, so I'm first generation. Mm -hmm. And um, w when I was growing up, there were, it was kind of an Albanian or an ethnic neighborhood, but that's, I remember a lot of that. And um, my father was always in a restaurant business, and my mother was a homemaker. Did you speak Albanian as a child? Very little. Yeah. I still know a few words, and mm -hmm. they're not all good words. You know, you <laughs> remember the bad ones. <laughs> when and where did you enter the military? It was, uh, I was living in, in Darby, Pennsylvania, and I joined the Air Force you know, in the Philadelphia area. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Jan uh, February 1951 when I entered the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And why did you choose the Air Force? Well, I was always uh, just loved airplanes. I used to f fly with a photographer I worked for, and I wanted to be a pilot. I had visions of me being a pilot and all this mm -hmm. stuff. And I made model airplanes, and it just it was seemed to me uh, that's where I wanted to be because I, I had to go in one branch or another, right. you know. So I I chose the Air Force. How did you happen to be flying with a photographer? Well, uh, I was in high school. I, I worked for a local photographer, and he once in a while would be contracted to take aerial photographs, usually for legal purposes. So we'd go up in this small seaplane, and he'd be flying. I'd be in the back, hanging out the side of the plane with this big camera, taking pictures, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Why did you join, I, I understand why you joined the Air Force, but why did you join the military? Because uh, at that time I had to go in, you know, there was no choice. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have, if I'd waited, I would have been drafted. So I wanted to pick the service, a branch that I wanted to be in rather than you know, something else. Did your friends or family join? No, my brother was too young. and. Uh, some high school friends may have joined, I, I'm not sure. A lot were, some were drafted. Could you tell me about your basic training? Yeah, that was in New York, in Geneva, New York, at Samson Air Force Base. 
It was uh, a Navy base that had been converted to it hurriedly converted to an Air Force base because mm -hmm. there was a big rush to get recruits in because the war was really heating up. And so I was there for eight weeks um, where, you know, had the usual basic training plus testing and so forth. And from there, that's where, you know, I went into uh, training uh, for uh, aerial gunnery and mm -hmm. electronics. And what does an aerial gunner do? <clears throat> well, the B-29 had the first um, elect uh, computer-operated gunnery system. It was, mm -hmm. the guns were remotely controlled. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the, the training consisted of electronics to, so that we could first understand the operation of the system and also repair it and also uh, the actual firing of the guns and uh, <clears throat> so uh, there w the training was pretty extensive and it was actually th a lot thrown at us for mm -hmm. high school graduates uh, mm -hmm. and um, but it was it was interesting and um, the uh, B-29 uh, Really, they were taken out of mothballs. They were actually a World War II airplane, but at the time, that time, there they had no really active heavy bomber, and the only thing left they had that no the old B-17s are all in the desert. But they took out the B-29 as a stopgap till they got a new modern-day bomber, like I think it was the um, B-49 or B-50. Eventually came out, so they had hundreds of them in the desert, and they took them out and um, used them till you no know, uh, at the beginning, all actually practically all through the Korean War, just about. What about how does it compare to the B fifty two? The B fifty two came much later. Um, okay. Maybe um, the B B fifty two was a bigger bomber. Mm -hmm. Is a big. It's still in service. And uh, it, uh, it's an all jet bomber. And uh, um, so it, it's, uh, the B-29 was uh, actually a dated bomber where the B-52 when it came out was the uh, state of the art. Was the B-29 a propeller? Propeller, yeah, four propeller engines. Okay. Where was your first duty station? It was in Denver, Colorado. That's where I got the, uh, the all the tr most of the training. Right. And throughout your military career, did your duties uh, change? Uh, no, the uh, my duties stayed pretty much the same, but the assignments changed. Mm -hmm. And what what assignments did you have? Well, uh, after Denver, uh, we were sent to. Uh, Randolph Field in Texas, mm -hmm. and that's where they brought crews together. The you know, pilot, bombardiers, gunners, radio, radar. They brought all the crews together, trained them, and then they either went directly over to the Far East or they went to stateside duty. We uh, and at that, at that time the war was really going full blast and. But we were lucky enough to get an assignment in California. Mm -hmm. And when you say the war, you mean the Korean War? The Korean right? War, yes. Mm -hmm. So from there you went to California? California to March Air Force Base mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Riverside, California. And how was that? That was great duty. It was a year and a half there. Yeah. yeah. And what did you do there? Well, we, you, know, you always continue your training. Right. And it never stops. And the training assignments varied. You know, practicing bombing um, targets on the ground, um, either maybe electronically or with actually live bombs, like on the Salton Sea. There was a, uh, a target in the middle of the lake there. Uh, we'd bomb that. And uh, remember, we bombed the corner of Sears and Roebuck's building downtown LA. <laughs> By electronics, oh. yes. <laughs> so. 
Uh, you mentioned the something sea. Would you repeat that? The, the Salton Sea. I missed what you said. The Salton said. Sea is a. It, it's in the desert, uh -huh. um, um, inland from California, west of Cal east of California, uh -huh. and in the middle of the desert, this large uh, saltwater lake. Uh -huh. It's not really a lake, it's underground. I guess it's fed from the underground to the ocean. And it's like a dead sea though. And so it's huge. So at one part of that, uh, there are targets that, that we would practice bomb. But, uh, you must must have reflected a lot when the more, more recent wars, when they say the wars are entirely electronic. I didn't realize that uh, the electronic aspect went back to your era. Yeah, yeah, it did, and um, they could they could practice electronic and score it and see how they did. And uh, as far as the gunners, uh, there would be fighter jets that would or propeller planes would attack us, and we'd shoot at each other with film. Mm -hmm. There would be a set of bullets, and yeah. then they would score the film, see how we did. So. So did you play games as though one side was the enemy and one side was the... Oh yeah, the enemy. fighters, yeah. Uh, to, to the fighters, we would be the enemy. To yeah. us, they would be the enemy, right. so... How about overseas duties? Well, yeah, from... Um, well, one, one interesting... Uh, before we get uh, over, One interesting assignment I had in California was they were having a nuclear bomb test in Nevada. So we were assigned to to observe the test and to um, follow the nuclear cloud when it went up, so they would know where it was, because you know, it would drift uh, eastward, and uh, they they just wanted to know where it was, so they could warn airlines and where it was going until it dissipated, and there would be fallout, you know, wherever the cloud was. So we went on three of those. We would fly to. Um, Davis Monthan Air Force Base, and we were stationed there to, for the test. And uh, so usually uh, it was like three o'clock in the morning, some or two o'clock in the morning, and uh, you couldn't see anything. And we'd be about thirty-five thousand feet, and about fifty miles from the site, and um, then we could hear, you know, them uh, over the intercom when the, the bomb was going to go off, and and we had these thick black goggles, and uh, you couldn't see anything with those things. But when the bomb went off, it was almost, even with the goggles, it was blinding. You know, uh, just turned night into like high noon, even brighter than that, you couldn't see anything. Then it would just dim, gradually dim. And these were small nuclear bombs. Where were you when the bombs went off? We were about 35,000 feet. Uh, about 50 miles away, pr approximately. Yeah. But what were you in a plane? Or yeah, we were in a plane. Yeah, in we were a plane airborne. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we. Our job was to be at a safe distance, and then after it was, uh, we had Geiger counters in the plane. Our job was to f know where that nuclear cloud was going, and uh, that made some. It would last. We would be in the air for maybe up to 12 hours just following it around. So you literally followed the cloud yeah. to track it? Yeah. yeah. I've never heard of anyone uh, <laughs> doing that. We went on three of those, three separate in, in, uh, tests. Have you ever heard of anyone from that distance being concerned about um, exposure to radiation? <clears throat> well, um, we, uh, when we landed, they would check us. We didn't even have Geiger counters. We had a Geiger counter in front of the plane. And sometimes they would find that the plane was, had gotten dirty with the radiation, so they just washed the plane down. And we, I, can, I don't remember anyone in my crew getting uh, dosed up. Uh, I, I know there were people on the ground, and I think some of those people really, I had, Gotten a questionnaire once from some agency of the government about this test. You know, they just wanted some information about me, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, that's 
I no, it's uh, we 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 try to stay at a safe distance where we wouldn't get too much radiation. Yeah. But I remember one time uh, the cloud kind of settled over Salt Lake City, so we were going around it, waiting for it to move and. I don't know what was happening to Salt Lake City, but the cloud was right over. But then finally it dissipated. So they probably had a little fallout there or in Salt Lake? Uh, I'm sure they did, yeah. yeah. So after that... Um, the, then we, then uh, we went back to... Uh, my crew was disbanded because the, the uh, officers were reservists and they went they went home, and so they sent everyone else back to Randolph Field to get another crew. Yeah. And this time we did go overseas and went to Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. And what did you do in Okinawa? Well, the war was still going when we left, and when we got there, it had just ended. And um, the Korean War. The Korean yeah. War, uh, yeah, and. Um, so we, the peace negotiations were continuing, and uh, so we stayed there for ten months till uh, the, uh, the the peace negotiations had ended, and there was some sort of agreement. And but while we we're there, we would fly up to the thirty eighth parallel and back ever so often. Mm -hmm. And what was the purpose of? Just for training and a reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. Kadena Air Base was a huge air base, and uh, there were, um, I was in a 307th bomb wing, mm -hmm. and um, the uh, I had a picture here of well, this is a formation flying over Korea. I don't know if you can get That's that. A great photo. I took that from the right gunner's position. Yeah. And what and was it like flying in formation over Korea? It was fine, but you know, <coughs> when in actual combat, they had stopped f flying formation because, in daylight, because the losses were too heavy. So they, yeah. they went to night bombing and right. single stream, right. one plane at a time, and bombing by radar. That's, well. So we did that for 10 months, and uh, Okinawa was uh, it was an interesting island, and I toured the island with my camera and took a lot of pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were highways, modern highways, mm -hmm. and a far cry from uh, what it was when at the end of World War II. That was the last island taken during World War II, and the losses were really mm -hmm. extremely heavy. And from there, they were going to invade Japan, mm -hmm. and that would have been that would have been just almost unimaginable what would have happened, you know, if we had done that. But um, the fact that you know, I know it's controversial that the nuclear bombs actually ended the war and actually saved mm -hmm. lives, and mm -hmm. the uh, fire bombing that. Going back to World War II, the fire bombing that the B-29s did on Tokyo caused much more losses than either Nagasaki right. or Hiroshima. Did you have a chance to um, meet uh, Japanese people on Okinawa? Oh, I met a lot. Yes. Yeah. How, I some, how was that? Uh, it was. It was. Um, there were a lot of uh, Okinawa people who worked at the base, you know, yeah. and um, the people I found friendly and uh, curious. There, there were some things that happened from time to time. There, there was like an element of people who didn't want us there, but overall, uh, I think the relationships were good, and I love taking pictures of the, especially of the children. I have one here somewhere. Oh. Great this is a little kid who was at a Shinto shrine uh, 
and he has a United Nations airplane in his uh. hand. <laughs> that was taken in 1953. So he's middle aged now. <laughs> yeah. So. So overall, there were, um, you, there were some people who didn't want you there. Yes. But yeah. Sometimes there would be incidents with uh, the military people uh, that you know would get a lot of publicity, but. I don't know how it is now. Uh, I think um, there was a lease, and I think it's expired, that uh, the United States had on Okinawa. Um, so I, um, the base is still in use, I know that. It's Did you have a chance to mix with Japanese people who are off the base and not working for the base? Well, when I go into the the village, Koza village, there was a lot of shopping stores there, mm -hmm. and uh, I bought, I would buy photographic equipment and so forth. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the taxi drivers, they had all these old American cars. That's my only contact, because they, uh, some could speak a little English, and I was gradually learning uh, their language. And there was, in, in Koza village, there was a movie theater there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll never guess what was playing there. Uh, going with the wind. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go in. I, I don't know if it had Japanese titles or what. Did you form good friendships? Not really, no. Mm -hmm. I did, no, with the, the guys I was flying with and working with. I, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's what I meant, with the oh, yeah. fellows yeah. in the armed services. Yeah. Yeah. It turned out. One fellow I met lived in the next town. I lived in Derby, he oh, lived yeah. in Collingdale. Yeah. So uh, we became friends and when we got uh, out of the service, we, we both started going to college and hanging out together. What is your most memorable experience from overseas? Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, from overseas, I, I'd say it was the uh, people, you know, uh, that, um, especially when you see the children, you realize that there's no difference than any of us. It mm -hmm. just, especially when you see the kids, because you mm -hmm. see they're doing the same things you did when you were a kid. And just as we get older, we seem to, I don't know, go separate ways or customs and labels and all that stuff. And uh, the other thing, you know, I was in Wake, I, on a way over, I was in Wake Island, Hawaii, Okinawa, Japan. But the thing that struck me the most is boy, there's no place like the United States. It's just, mm -hmm. You realize how lucky we are and uh, what we take for granted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was your R&R um, &R like? I just had one two, one two week R&R. &R. They usually sent the crews to Hong Kong, but unfortunately, we they just sent us to a place that's pretty nice on Okinawa, especially for R and R, mm -hmm. and that was fun. Just it was on the beach, and uh, we could do whatever we wanted, no duty. It was nice. Uh, tell me about Wake Island. Wake Island, we just stopped there to refuel, and mm -hmm. what struck me was. That place is just big enough for a runway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was so small, I know, and it was so important. You know, we heard so much about it during World War II. And then uh, well, Kwajalein Island, it's the same thing. I, we stopped there on our way back to refuel, and uh, same thing. It's so so it's tiny, and uh, yeah. It's, uh, but Hawaii, when you see Hawaii from the air, it's just so magnificent, the, the color, the bright green against the ocean. Just, we were there for, for three days on the way back. And on the way over, we just stopped to refuel. How do you feel about the Korean War and um, how it was resolved? Well, um, <clears throat> I think, you know, you know North Korea is, it seems to still be a problem. Uh, at the time, you know, 
North Korea invaded South Korea, and it was a clear-cut thing, and we, we felt that we had to, I mean, I felt we were doing the right thing. I, I still think that, as far as Korea is concerned. And um, it's just too bad that we couldn't have got a better resolution, but instead of the country being uh, permanently divided. How did the, the men in these armed services feel about MacArthur and how he was treated by Truman? Uh, well, I've heard, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't in Korea at right. the time, right. but my, uh, I think it's kind of a split thing. Uh, yeah. I think most, most of the guys felt that the president is still the commander in chief and he calls the shots, not some field general. Mm -hmm. And I felt Truman did the right thing. From um, when you returned to the United States, you were, uh, what did, did you continue with the, um, the Air Force? No, I, uh, I you know, considered joining the reserves, but I was, my priority at that time was to get, go and get a college education. Right. And what did you get your degree in? In engineering. Yeah. Uh, Where did you go to school? Uh, uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia. Yeah. <clears throat> when you uh, returned, oh, what, was the, what was your homecoming like? Well, there was really no homecoming per se. Uh, 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 it was just my, oh, all my relatives were happy to see me, but it was it was just like you know there had been nothing, and uh, and I guess that's why they call it the Forgotten War. You know, it it just ended, and people came home, and uh, there were no big bands, or we didn't expect any really. We're just I was happy to get out, and uh, although you know I enjoyed the experience, I was ready to get on with my life. And, do you feel the war is still equally as forgotten, or, uh, or is it possible that people are now paying more attention to the Korean War? I don't think so. Not the Korean War. I think Vietnam, mm. yes, but not the Korean War. I think it's still a forgotten war. Mm. At that time, I, they tried to call it a police action, you know, and mm. they wouldn't even call it a war. Mm. How important uh, was serving in the military? You. Oh, to me, it was uh, uh, an unforgettable experience, and I, I think it was equal almost to a college education right. and, and experience and you know, free travel and, <laughs> and the people you meet and friends you make. It. Is there um, a thought or a memory you'd like to share with? the community or posterity about your experiences in the armed services? <clears throat> well, I, I think we, we still, I think what we have to think of is a world community that it's, right. we're, there's only one race and that's a human race. And, uh, <coughs> and I think, um, we should keep our military strong. I think we've let it slip uh, over the past 10, 20 years. It's gradually been declining. We've taken benefits away from uh, veterans and from service people. And I think we should reverse. We've got to, we're the world leader and we have to have the military to back it up. Good people, everyone looks to us to, 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 for help and to make decisions. And, I think after Kosovo, we've stretched our military uh, to pretty far. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. You've seen so much and done so much, and thank you for spending your time uh, with us. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you.